In this review video, we'll be focusing on how to correctly collect a sample. This question is taken from an FRQ, and to summarize it briefly, we have researchers that are looking to compare the caloric intake of high schoolers in the United States. So they take a random sample of ninth grade students from one high school in a rural area, and then they take another sample from one high school in an urban area. Each of these students is asked to keep records of all the food that they consume in a day. And on the next slide, we're gonna be shown a stem plot, which shows the uh, daily caloric intake per kilogram of body weight for each of those students. In part A, we're asked to write a few sentences comparing these distributions. So here's the stem plot showing this data. Remember, anytime we're asked to describe a distribution, it's just a SOX problem. But when we're asked to compare the distribution, we need to include comparative language, things like more than, less than, the same as, different than, et cetera. So we're doing SOX on both of these distributions, and we wanna make sure that we have this key comparative language. So let's start with the centers. Uh, and comparing the daily caloric intake, this is just adding context to the problem. For urban students versus rural students, urban students tend to consume less, that's the comparative word, calories than their rural counterparts. Now these are the medians. I got these medians just by crossing off uh, one from the bottom, one from the top, okay, until we end up with the middle values. Uh, it's on top, okay, so the median is in between those two, that's 32 uh, calories per kilogram. All right, after that, on to uh, the variability. There is more variability in the rural students, I'm giving the range here, than the urban students. Now, anytime you reference range, you're not saying it's ranging from 26 to 42, okay? In statistics, range is a single number, it's how far spread out they are. The shapes of the distributions are also different. Daily caloric intake is skewed to the right for urban, while it's approximately uniform for rural students. Okay, there's no apparent outliers in either group. Now I'd gotten all that information just from looking at the graph, but if we wanted to, we could take this data and put it into our calculator. This is all the rural data uh, into list one there, and then we run one variable stats on that list, we can get an average, we can get a standard deviation. Down here, we would see all the quartiles. So if we wanted more specific information about this data, we can get it from our calculator. Part B, is it reasonable to generalize these findings to all rural and urban ninth grade students in the United States? When you're asked a question like this about generalizing our results, it's asking you, is it okay to take what we found in these samples and apply it to the whole broad population of ninth grade rural and urban students in the United States. First thing to check is, was this uh, sample collected randomly? If there was no randomization, it's not valid. This did have randomization, but the key thing, here's the text of the problem. It says that we have a random sample of ninth grade students from one high school in that rural area. And then we have another sample from one high school in an urban area, okay? So the population is not all students in the United States, it's specific to these high schools and only these high schools. We can't generalize our sample uh, beyond what we're drawing, what population we're drawing from. So our answer here, no, we can't generalize this. The random samples were taken from a single rural high school and a single urban high school. We can generalize to those populations only, meaning that these findings would apply to all the students in each of those two high schools. Part C, we have researchers who wanna conduct a similar study. They're looking at two different plans. In plan one, we have each student in our sample record all the food that they eat in a single day. That's gonna be the total that we would put into our STEM plot. In plan two, we're gonna assign all our students the same seven day period. They'll record all the food that they eat and we'll find an average that they've eaten per day over those seven days. Assuming that the students keep accurate records, which plan, one or two, would better meet the goal of this study. Now we're gonna to wanna to select plan two, but we need to justify it. So the reason that we wanna select plan two and not plan one is when data is collected appropriately, a bigger sample size is always better. And in plan two, we're collecting data over seven days versus one day for plan one. So as long as we're not making any mistakes in the collection of our data, more data is better. Okay, a better explanation is to note something that's incorrect in plan one or a problem with plan one. So if we choose plan one, 
it's possible that the number of calories consumed is going to vary depending on what day they're recording them. Okay, so maybe students are going to eat more on the weekends versus the weekdays or vice versa. In plan two, we won't have to worry about that. We're collecting the same seven days worth of data for each student. It's going to include weekends and weekdays. So if there are days where they're eating more or less, uh, it's going to be included for all students. And then we're just finding an average across those seven days. Increasing the sample size is going to decrease the variability of the sample. In part D, we're being asked to construct parallel box plots. That's two box plots on the same scale. We always want to make the scale first. And when we make the scale, we want to make sure that it's large enough to include the minimum across both of these samples and the maximum. So my scale here will include that 26 and 51. Anytime we make any kind of display, we want to make sure that we title it. As I mentioned before, we can get these values just by putting the whole list of data into our calculator and running one variable stats. So let's make this urban one first. I always start off by drawing the box. Okay, so this is going to go from 29 up to 36, median at 32. This minimum is going to go down to 26, and the maximum will go up to 42. I want to make sure I label this. This is my urban graph. And then same thing with a rural one. Okay, so this is going from 35.5 to 45.5, median at 41, whisker down to 32, and up to 51. Okay, if we look at those just at a glance, we can see that rural students are consuming more calories on average. Now that question had just asked me to make parallel box plots and not a modified box plot. Modified box plot would include any outliers. So in Part E, we're asked to verify where, whether or not there are any outliers in the data. So for urban students, we want to find the lower fence and the upper fence. Lower fence we find by Q1, quartile 1, minus 1 and a half times the IQR. IQR is Q3 minus Q1. So the IQR here is 7. Okay, so Q1, 29, minus 1 and a half times the IQR gives us a lower fence of that. Okay, anything less than 18.5 would be an outlier. Our minimum is 26, so there's no low outliers. Upper fence is the same thing, except we use Q3 and a plus sign instead of that minus sign. We get an upper fence of 46.5. Anything above that would be an outlier. Our maximum is 42, so there's no high outliers. We do the same thing with rural students. Anything below 20.5 or above 60.5 is an outlier. Everything in our data set is between those two numbers, so there are no outliers in either data set. In Part F, we're asked to describe how a researcher might use clusters to gather data in a given county. As a reminder, when we're dealing with a cluster sample, we select one group or sometimes multiple groups, and we perform a census on that group. If the group is representative of the population as a whole, it's quicker and it's cheaper to conduct a cluster sample compared to something like a simple random sample. So for this problem, the researcher could select randomly one urban school and one rural school. Make sure you include randomly here because randomization is a key part to any sampling plan. If the daily caloric intake of the students at a single school is representative of all similar urban or rural schools, conducting a cluster sample is a quicker, cheaper way to gather data on a large number of students. Next up, a researcher observes that rural students eat more home-cooked meals than urban students, and a journalist writes an article stating that home-cooked meals cause an increase in calorie intake. Describe a confounding variable that may be the cause of this. Anytime you see this word, okay, saying that something causes the other one, remember we can only come to that conclusion when we have a randomized experiment meaning that we would have to assign students whether or not they're going to eat a home-cooked meal. That's not the case here. There's, it's possible that there's some other variable at play. Okay, so a confounding variable is a variable that affects our response variable. That's the caloric intake uh, in a way that makes it impossible to attribute any observed difference to the explanatory variable, which is home-cooked meals. So for this problem, Perhaps rural students burn more calories than urban students and therefore need to eat larger meals to replenish them. If 
this situation is true. It wouldn't be clear whether, whether any differences in those mean calories consumed is due to the home cooked meals or the fact that these rural students are expending more calories in a given day. Maybe they have to walk a farther distance to their bus stop, for example. If you were given a list of all students at your school, explain how you would randomly select 50 of them for a sample. Anytime you're asked a question like this, I want you to do it this way. So to start, number the students from one to however many there are. We don't know in this case. Note that you are not numbering the students randomly. You're numbering them sequentially. Part two, use a random number generator to randomly generate numbers in the appropriate range. We're going to ignore any repeats and we're going to continue that until we have the required sample size. And lastly, select the students with that corresponding number. So we would number the students from one to however many there are in our list, use a random number generator to generate 50 numbers in that range, ignoring any repeat selections, sample the students on the list with those corresponding numbers. Part I, describe a variable that might be important to create a strata and why we chose that variable. So for this problem, a good thing to stratify on would be gender. And a refresher on why we stratify, we're going to stratify to create groups of similar subjects. We're going to group all the males together, all the females together. We have groups uh, that are similar based on their gender. At this point, we would randomly sample within those two groups. Okay? The reason we stratify is because we expect those groups to produce different results. We probably would think that males would eat more than females will. And the purpose is to reduce variability in the sample. If we were to take a second sample, our results would be more similar with the first on average with stratification than without stratification. So our answer would be it's reasonable to expect that males and females have a different mean daily caloric intake. So it would be appropriate to stratify on gender. Conduct a simple random sample of males and females for each school, and that would ensure that each sample consists of an appropriate balance of those two genders. This is going to reduce variability that arises from gender differences in daily caloric intake. Lastly, what inference procedure would you use to compare the two groups? This is a name the test problem. So the steps to figure out what test you would use. Okay, first we want to figure out is the data categorical, meaning it would be a z-test, or quantitative, which would lead us to doing a t-test. In this case, we're finding the number of calories, that's quantitative, okay, it's numerical data. How many samples are there? It's always either one or two. In this case, we have two samples, one from an urban area, one from a rural area. And third thing we want to ask ourselves is in this situation where we have two samples on a quantitative data set, are the samples independent or are they paired in some way? If they're independent, it would just be a two sample t-test. If they're paired, we would do a match pairs t-test. So here we have two quantitative samples of randomly selected students from two separate high schools. The data is not paired in any way and the random, random selection is gonna make these uh, results independent of one another. So we're gonna conduct a two sample t-test.